All right, welcome to the second lecture for week two. This one is on colonial society. And I'm going to start with the Plymouth Colony. The Plymouth Colony is where the pilgrims live. I'm pretty sure we've all heard of pilgrims before. And the pilgrims are going to settle in the Plymouth Colony, which is north of what is today Boston, in November of 1620. They originally settle off of the coast of Cape Cod and then move inland from there. Now, the Pilgrims were a group of Calvinists. Uh, you might know Calvinists better today as Presbyterians, but basically Calvinists, they were a religious group who wanted to separate from both the Church of England and from the Catholic Church, and they wanted to purify Christianity. They thought that they had a better way to do things. Um, the Pilgrims are going to come over on a ship called the Mayflower. Uh, originally, there were two ships. There was the Mayflower and the Speedwell. Uh, the Speedwell sprung a leak and had to turn around, so only the Mayflower came over. The Mayflower had a total of 70 non-pilgrims and 30 pilgrims for a total of 100 people. So the pilgrims were the minority. Uh, a lot of people think that the Mayflower was full of pilgrims. In reality, it was a minority. But because the pilgrims were the ones who bought and paid for the ship and paid for the trip, they are the ones in charge. Before the ship gets to their destination, uh, they're going to sign something known as the Mayflower Compact. And what the Mayflower Compact did is it, it was a, a religious document, but it was also like a legal document that was going to allow religious freedom. So if you were not one of the pilgrims, they were not going to require you to be a pilgrim. Uh, it's also going to give a, an early governmental system and sets up the way that the Plymouth Colony is going to work. Now, the Pilgrims, they get to Cape Cod in November of 1620, and then they get to Plymouth in December of 1620. And by the time they get settled in, it's really, really cold. Uh, New England, cold, wet, snowy. By the time the winter's over, we're only at about 50% of a survival rate. Um, however, the surviving pilgrims are going to get help from a group known as the Poconokets. Uh, the Poconokets have had prior experience with people from Europe, so um, they're not going to get sick or anything like that. But what the Poconokets want is protection. Uh, they have an enemy called the Narragansetts. And the Narragansetts and the Poconokets are fighting each other. In exchange for getting help and providing food to the settlers, the Poconokets, they want protection and guns from the pilgrims. And that deal is going to be made. The, there's no first Thanksgiving. Things don't happen the way you might think. But they do help each other out. Uh, you may have heard of a Native American named Squanto. Squanto was real. Squanto was a Poconokit. Squanto did help the pilgrims, but Squanto was also sent back to England and kept prisoner and forcibly taught English and forced to work for the English government. We know a lot about the Plymouth Colony and its settling because of one guy, uh, William Bradford. Uh, William Bradford, he writes a book called Of Plymouth Plantation, William Bradford is also going to be the governor of the Plymouth Colony, I think, six or eight times. And William Bradford, he talks about how the pilgrims are, how they come to be. He talks about how the pilgrims originally lived in what is today the Netherlands. And then he talks about them coming to the America, settling the Plymouth Colony. And at the end of his book, he talks about everybody, all 100 people that were on the Mayflower are listed in Bradford's book along with what happens to them and who their descendants are. So uh, if you know of anybody who says that they their family came over on the, the Mayflower, you can pull out William Bradford's book. You can show them the list of names and say, okay, then, well, which one is your relative? There's another colony that's founded just north of where the Plymouth Colony is, and this one is settled in 1629 by a guy named John Winthrop. John Winthrop is a Christian minister, and he is the leader of the Puritans. Now, this is where things might get a little bit confusing. All of the pilgrims are Puritans. 
not all Puritans are pilgrims. The pilgrims are a small little group, a small little subset of Puritans. The pilgrims are radical. The Puritans are just different. Well, the Puritans, um, they're going to purchase part of the Virginia territory. They're going to sail across the ocean, and their goal is to go to the Virginia territory, but um, they ran out of beer. And I'm not kidding. They ran out of beer, which means they had nothing to drink, and they got off the boat in New England and said, you know what, this is good enough. We'll live here. This is a fairly large settlement. There are over 700, nearly 800 people who are going to be with John Winthrop. They're mostly lower middle class and farming families. And the idea, um, what the Massachusetts Bay Colony is supposed to be, and John Winthrop himself tells us that using his sermon, A Model of Christian Charity. Uh, that is one of the readings that you have to read as well. Uh, to summarize, John Winthrop famously says that his colony will be a shining city on a hill. Basically, I'm going to run my colony the way I want it to run. I'm going to let it be the model for everybody else. And I'm going to base it on Christian ideals and Christian principles. And everybody is going to see how successful they are. And everybody is going to want to be us. <clears throat> Winthrop believed, if others saw how successful his settlement was, that the Church of England would change to be more like his society. It didn't quite work out that way, but it's a lofty goal. It's a lofty idea. Now, whether you're a pilgrim or a Puritan, your community is based on the church. Both Puritans and pilgrims, they are congregationalists. And what that means is they meet together in a congregation they have a structure. There is a defined leader of the church. There are elders in the church. And if you're sitting in one of the church benches, you have a certain duty to the church. Uh, the church is literally in the center of town. And that is so everybody has to see the church. You're required to go to the church. You're required to attend the church. You're required to, to give money to the church. All the public meetings are at the church. Now, what makes this significant is technically church and state are separate, but in practice and reality, they're not. The leaders of the community are the leaders of the church. The money taken up in the church is the money that funds the community. The laws become the same. And um, yeah, the church and this, the government are together. As far as your family goes, the husband has all authority. I don't mean he can like kill you or anything like that, but he can tell anybody in the family what to do. His word is law. He is the head of the household. Uh, women are treated like perpetual minors. Women have no legal rights other than what their husband bestows upon them. So it's a very male-oriented and male-driven community. The population of these two colonies, the Plymouth Colony and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, the population grows pretty quick, and it's because of natural population growth. Uh, you know, a guy and a girl are going to do what a guy and a girl do, and nine months later, a baby appears. But it's also because there's lower death rates in the New England communities. Not everybody gets along. There are several religious dissenters. There are people who don't agree with the Puritan way of life. Uh, famously, Roger Williams uh, Roger Williams, he believed church and state should be separate. He did not think attendance at church should be required. And uh, he's going to speak out against the Puritan church as a thank you. He's going to, to be banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he and uh, something like a dozen of his followers are going to buy land from the Narragansett Native American group. And they're going to create a colony called uh, Providence. And Providence today is better known as the state of Rhode Island. Anne Hutchinson, she believed that women should have a role in the public life and she believed that women should have a role in church. And Anne Hutchinson, she's going to um, gather a church following. She's going to have um, I don't want to say church leadership, but She's going to have a, um, a congregation of her own, 
And because she is preaching and she is active in the public, she's going to be banished from Massachusetts Bay Colony too. Uh, unlike Roger Williams, who goes and creates his own colony, Anne Hutchinson kind of just wanders the wilderness. And by the end of her day, she ends up in Long Island, and she dies actually in a Native American attack on a settlement in Long Island. When word of her death gets back to the Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they basically say that it's what she deserves. She was pregnant with the, with the child of the devil and that um, it was divine intervention that she died. Last but not least, some religious dissenters are also the Quakers and the Baptists. I'll talk about the Quakers more when I talk about Pennsylvania. But uh, both the Quakers and the Baptists, they were seen as uh, unwanted. And in some cases, they were banished or executed if they were found to be in the Quaker, or not Quaker, but the, uh, the Puritan colonies. I'm going to skip the Salem Witch Trial, but I highly recommend you watch this video. Uh, Salem Witch Trials. Uh, probably one of the more famous things that happens in North America during the colonial times. And I'm just going to make it really, really short for you. Uh, there are two well-to-do families and two kids from these families start accusing people of witches. Betty Paris and Ab Abby Williams, they're like 8 and 10. They get sick. They accuse a slave woman of reading their poems and, and causing them to become witches. And then two lower class women are going to be accused of being witches as well. And before you know it, everybody's a witch. Fingers are pointed at everybody else. It's like that Spider-Man meme that you see. And I know that you know what I'm talking about. And... By the time 300 people are accused of being witches, uh, there are trials left and right. 30 plus people are hanged from a tree for being witches. And the girls are going to say, you know what, we made up this whole thing. So um, it's a total and complete mess, but it's fascinating to learn about. All right, two other colonies to talk about, and then we'll have most of our colonies here in one day. The Pennsylvania Colony is founded by the Quaker Oats guy there at the top. Uh, he's not actually the Quaker Oats guy. His name was William Penn. Uh, William Penn creates Pennsylvania in 1681. William Penn is a Quaker. Uh, the word Quaker, it is a way to make fun of a group known as the Society of Friends. Uh, this is a Christian group that they believe in simplicity. They believe in pacifism. Uh, the Quakers think everybody is equal. So if you went to a Quaker church, everybody sits there in, in silence. There is nobody leading the sermon. You're, and the idea is you'll be washed in inner light and the Spirit of the Lord will come to you after enough prayer and meditation. And they're called Quakers because whenever that, that feeling of Holy Spirit washes over you, they start to shake and quake in their seats. So the... the Quakers of Pennsylvania are quite different than any of the other religious groups. Now, William Penn, he is actively going to recruit religious dissenters. Penn is going to find people who don't fit in anywhere else and invite them to come into Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is going to be a very tolerant place, at least for a little while. Georgia is going to be founded by the guy in the bottom. That's James Oglethorpe. And in 1732, James Oglethorpe is going to go to the King of England, and he's going to ask for permission to start his own colony. And his colony is going to be a debtor's colony. Uh, once again, long story short, the Enlightenment saw the idea that people should be treated more equally and more fairly, and that there should be rights and constitutions and all this other stuff. James Oglethorpe is a believer in all of that. So he believed that people who are thrown in debt because they are thrown in prison because they own debt should be given a chance to pay that debt off. So Georgia and James Oglethorpe are going to be how that's done. <clears throat> because James Oglethorpe is taking people who were formerly in debt, uh, he's going to set some rules. No alcohol, no slaves, you have to work your own land, and nobody can buy or sell land. And... Georgia is going to become kind of a second chance place for a lot of people who are, um, you know, in trouble with the law. 
Unfortunately, the vision of James Oglethorpe does not last very long by, I want to say it's like 1752 or something like that. The king has already taken over Georgia. Um, I know it's the early 1750s. I can't think of the exact date right now. But Georgia is going to uh, fall under control of the king and James Oglethorpe and all of his supporters lose control of Georgia. Um, so in some ways, the original plan of Georgia was a failure, but the colony itself does succeed. All right, um, population overall in the colonies is going to grow. Um, during the 1700s, we get 650,000 plus people who come to the British colonies. Um, most of those, about 320,000 of them are slaves who come here because they're forced to. Uh, the others are going to be like Scots, Irish, Scots, Northern English. Uh, here in Georgia, there are going to be some, some uh, Germans who are invited to come over. So it's a real mix of European immigration. And so all this immigration is going to cause population growth. Uh, there's also natural uh, population growth, though, because um, you get early marriages, you get frequent births, you get people who you know, have lots of kids. And then you get lowering mortality rates so people aren't dying as often. The three powers of, Eng of England, Spain, and France are going to play off of each other here in North America. Uh, England, France, and Spain are going to get Native American friends, and then they're going to war with each other and fight with each other. And the Native Americans don't mind this because they can work it to their advantage. Uh, they can make a deal with more than one person and then go with uh, whoever's going to give them the best option. Um, as far as African slavery goes, almost as soon as African slavery starts, there are anti-slavery movements, there are rebellions and everything. Uh, the most famous of these early rebellions is the Stono Rebellion. It happens in 1739, just a little bit south of Charleston on the coast in the salt marshes. Uh, your everyday life, um, basic education, you're going to learn how to read and write. Uh, you're going to learn basic math. At least that's what the expectation is in reality. You're so busy that you don't have time for school. And if you do have time for school, it means that you're wealthy and don't need to work. Uh, most women are going to be illiterate. And if you are educated, it becomes a status symbol. So if you can't read, what do you do? You develop a verbal or an oral culture. So for those of you who are lower class, you're going to end up getting your information by word of mouth. It means that it's not necessarily uh, factual. Uh, people mishear people all the time. Um, there's no telephone to call, no newspapers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's kind of like the game telephone. If you've ever played telephone before, um, that's very much what's happening in the colonies. But if you are able to to pay for school, then you're upper crust. You've got a big house, you wear the powdered wigs, uh, you wear the fancy clothes. So very early in American history, you start to get two different social structures and two different classes of people developing. Um, religion. You primarily have two groups by the middle of the 1700s. You have the Congregationalists, and then you got Episcopalians who worship in a in a hierarchical setting. In other words, they're the ones that have the minister at the front. They have the deacons or the elders, and um, then you have the Quakers who have these informal meetings where everybody is equal. Um, at the same time, you have something called the Great Awakening, which is where the Methodist Church comes from. Uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield are the two best names of the, the um, Great Awakening. Both of them think that Christianity has become too intellectual and they kind of want to bring the spiritual part of it back into function. And the best version or the best um, example of what a Great Awakening sermon is is Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And 
Uh, I'm going to greatly paraphrase. You can read it on your own. Jonathan Edwards believes that uh, God is holding you in his hand over the pit of hell, and he can let you go at any time. The only reason he holds you in his hand is because he's being whispered to in his ear, hey, be nice to the people by Jesus. Um, George Whitefield does that as well, but he kind of takes it to the next level. And before you know it, uh, thousands of people are rededicating their lives to to Christianity, and the Methodist Church is going to be developed from this. Politics. Um, most of the colonies look the same. You've got a governor at the top. You've got a legislature, and then you've got the county-level courts and judges. Um, it doesn't really matter which col colony you're in. They're going to have a similar situation. There are a couple of colonies that only have one house, which means that they're unicameral. Um, I know for sure New Jersey is one of them, but most of them are going to look the same. The governor is the most powerful guy. The legislature is going to help them pass taxes and collect taxes. And then the county judges are the ones that put you in jail or put you to work. Um, but I think it's significant to know that this idea of self-rule, of being distanced from your governor or being distanced from your king, it develops very early. And from that distance comes this idea of self-government. So self-government, that idea doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's a thing that has been developing since the early 1700s. All right, that is it for this lecture. If you have any questions about anything, send me an email or um, you know, give me a call, stop by my office, whatever it might be. And um, make sure you get all the work for this week due by 11.59 p.m. on, um, I think it's Tuesday night. All right, we'll talk to you later. Have a good day. All right, did I manage to keep you awake during that? Yes. It's a lot of stuff, isn't it? Um, any questions about anything in this one here? No, sir. <sighs> There's so much more stuff to talk about with the Quakers, but I know if I make these too long, nobody's going to watch them. Um, the, the Quakers were actually called the Quakers to make fun of them because of the shaking they would do. So when you eat Quaker oats or something like that, the word Quaker was originally a, de a derogatory term towards the Society of Friends members. And today it's, you know, it's your Pop-Tarts and your cereal. It's just crazy how that works. All right. Um, I don't know. Do you feel so your second week doing this? You find it useful or helpful? Um. Yes. It it makes me have a little more background information to what I'm reading. Okay. And have a little to expect when I'm reading. Okay. Well, I'm glad it's helpful, and I'll keep doing it for you. Um. Next week, I'm gonna record it on a Tuesday if that works for you, because that's when I'm supposed to be doing these. So, or on a Wednesday, I mean, that's when I'm supposed to do them. Uh, it's just I forgot. Well, it's on Tuesday. I forgot that Tuesday wasn't Monday, so I've been a day off all week. So I need to fix that. <laughs> but anyways, that's it. Thanks for joining me. I'll quit talking now, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.